So Dr. Gunther received his PhD in energy and resources from the University of California at Berkeley in 1987. And he has worked at the intersection of environmental science and policy since 1979. He has extensive experience in applying science to the development of air, water, and endangered policy. And for the past several years has been working with a broad array of organizations to help prepare our region for changing climate. Today, I want to welcome Dr. Andrew Gunther talking about climate change, the science of pollution. Let's everybody give Dr. Gunther a big Golden Gate Breakfast Club welcome. Thank you so much. Um, can you guys, uh, I, I'm hoping you can just see my title screen. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so my wife and I have two kids and like all parents, we want our children to grow up in a world that's safe, healthy, and as productive as the world that our parents inherited from their grandparents. And briefly today, I want to explain to you why it is that the world scientific community is saying that our future, and particularly our kids' future, is going to take a serious turn for the worse unless we take immediate action. But before I do that, let me say what I'm not going to tell you. I can't seem to advance my slides all of a sudden. Oh, this worked when Tony and I practiced it. <laughs> That's all right. We, um, there we go. I'm not going to tell you what to believe. And I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. You have your own values you use to make those determinations. What I am going to tell you about is the scientific evidence that documents we have a big problem. And in so doing, I'm going to ask that you listen to the skeptics, the real skeptics, the scientists. Objective skepticism is the heart of the scientific process. The oldest scientific society in the world, the Royal Society of London, founded in 1662, has as its motto, don't take anybody's word for it. Now, we can think about our problem with three questions. Must we change, can we change, and will we change? To understand why the answer to this question is yes, we have to start with this guy. Fourier was a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson's. He marched with Napoleon, and he was a physicist studying heat. And it was Fourier who first realized that the Earth should be colder than it is, and he postulated that there was a layer of, of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere that acted like a blanket, keeping the Earth warmer than it otherwise would be. Turns out Fourier was right. This is a principle of physics now known as the greenhouse effect. The Earth gets almost all of its energy from the sun. Most of the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, striking the planet and warming it up. And just like anything else that warms up, the Earth starts radiating heat in the form of infrared radiation. Now, most of that radiation escapes into outer space but because of this layer of heat trap and gases, some of that radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere and radiated back down to the surface of the Earth. That's why the Earth has the temperature that it does. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, a very weak greenhouse effect. It's a very cold place. Venus has a very thick atmosphere, very powerful greenhouse effect, and has a surface temperature close to that of molten lead. And it's not because of the relative positions of the planets when compared to the sun, because Mercury, which of course is the closest planet to the sun, has a very thin atmosphere, a very weak greenhouse effect, and has an average surface temperature below that of Venus. Now, over the last 250, 300 years, humans have been act, add, adding prodigious amounts of heat trapping gases to the atmosphere, mainly by burning coal, oil, and natural gas, and by chopping down forests. And this has had the effect of thickening that layer of heat trapping gases. So now energy that used to escape in outer space is absorbed and sent back down to the surface of the earth. And that extra energy is what's forcing our climate to change. Now, Fourier postulates this in the 1820s. In 1859, Irish physicist John Tyndall demonstrates in the laboratory that in fact, there are components of air that can absorb heat. So this is the chemical mechanism underlying Fourier's hypothesis. And in 1896, and this is 20 years before Berkeley professor Alfred Wegener publishes The Theory of Continental Drift, Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius, later awarded the Nobel Prize, publishes what in essence is the theory of global warming. Here's the first page of his paper. Arrhenius calculated 
what the temperature of the Earth would be if there was twice as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And he did this with just a piece of paper and a pencil, which shows you how fundamental the physical principles are underlying what's happening on the Earth. Now, when Arrhenius made his calculations, uh, emissions of heat trapping gases shown with this red line had only just started. Uh, but by the 60s, they were significantly uh, aware, people were aware that it was accumulating in the atmosphere and President Johnson's science advisory panel warned him about this problem. Johnson talked about it publicly, but didn't do anything about it. And it wasn't just government scientists who were studying this, industry scientists were studying it as well. And uh, here's a quote from a scientist at Exxon, and they knew full well what was happening to the atmosphere. In 1978, the Jasons, the high-level scientific advisory panel of the Defense Department, warned President Carter about the national security threat that this problem posed. And President Carter asked the National Academy of Sciences to double check what the Jasons had said. And here's what the National Academy concluded. Maybe one of the great scientific understatements of the 20th century. And uh, still though, uh, uh, Carter then decided this was a serious problem for the country. Uh, as you might recall, he put solar panels on the White House. He recommended that we get 20% of our electricity from renewable sources by the year 2000. Um, but that's not what happened. What happened is Ronald Reagan was elected president. Reagan completely ignored the issue. Uh, he took the solar panels off the White House and um, uh, fossil fuel burning expanded around the world and emissions climbed significantly. Also during this time, the fossil fuel industry, it has been well documented, um, operated a major disinformation campaign, which continues today um, and has made it very difficult for us to address the problem. We're seeing now with our own eyes and instruments that what Arrhenius and other scientists predicted is happening. Uh, the earth is definitely getting hotter. There are five independent data sets. They all show the same thing. Um, this is a video from NASA showing how this heating is, is distributed around the planet. You see the years going by on the bottom there. And what you notice is there's more heating over land and over ocean. And there's more heating in generally on in the interior of the continents than at the coastlines. And as you see the years move in the 80s here and the heating greatly increases, there is more heating in the Arctic than there is in the tropics. And this pattern, which is known as Arctic amplification, the Jasons and the National Academy of Sciences predicted this would happen. Now, this data set only goes back to the 1880s because that's the first time we had enough thermometers around the planet to come up with an average temperature. Um, but how do we know this hasn't happened before? And scientists study that question using what are called proxies. These are things that we can measure much further back in time and we understand their relationship to temperature. A classic one that most people know about is tree rings. But a very important one is ice. Not only is there a, a temperature proxy by the nature of the oxygen atom that makes up the H2O molecule, but when ice forms, it can capture tiny bubbles of atmosphere. And so if you can find ancient ice, you can often find samples of ancient atmosphere. And when the methods were perfected for this kind of analysis, an international team was put together to go to Antarctica. It was, this was in the late 1990s to drill because the ice there is two miles thick and we can go back in time much further than 1884. In fact, we can go back in time 800,000 years. And I'll show you this data now. It was just, it was just published um, less than 20 years ago. So we're gonna, we're gonna go from on the screen from the right to the left, we're going back in time. And when we sample those tiny bubbles of atmosphere for carbon dioxide concentrations, this is what we see. So there's lots of variability. And in fact, what we're seeing here is the ice ages, but you see at no time was the carbon dioxide concentrations above about 290 parts per million. Now remember, we're squishing time on this axis. So this line that just appeared on your screen is 300 years thick by this scale. So it looks like things are changing really fast, but they're still changing over thousands of years. When we look at the temperature proxy, this is what we see. Temperature and carbon dioxide vary together, which is what you'd expect from the physics of the greenhouse effect. But I don't have modern industrial times on here yet, but I'm gonna add them now. So here's where we were as of April last year. 
vastly above anything we've seen in the last 800,000 years, going up 200 times faster than any other time in this record. And this is the source of the urgency in the message from the scientific community because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a long time. All the time it's there, it's absorbing energy that would otherwise have gone into outer space and pumping it back down to the planet. It's as though we've wrapped ourselves in a blanket that we can't take off. And if we continue our current pattern of burning more and more fossil fuels, then this is where we're gonna be in just 30 years. And if we wrap ourselves in this many blankets, the changes are gonna be so profound on the planet that scientists are making conclusions like this. Now, some people might say, wait, 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 wait. You know, humans are very adaptable creatures. You know, we, we can handle a change like this. And so one way of looking at that is to say, well, what has the temperature been during the time that human civilization has arisen? That's about 10,000 years. So if we look at the past 10,000 years, this is what we see. Temperatures rose about a degree Fahrenheit over thousand year, thousands of years, then declined again. Until right at the end of this, when you can see we have changed the climate, temperatures have now gone up almost two degrees Fahrenheit in just 200 years. If we allow carbon dioxide concentrations to continue to climb in the atmosphere, then this is what's gonna happen. Now, there's some debate in the scientific community about whether it'll be eight degrees Fahrenheit or seven degrees Fahrenheit, but there's absolutely no debate about the direction of this change. And it's because of the fundamental physical principles operating here. If you turn the flame on under the kettle, the water in the kettle gets hotter and hotter and it doesn't start cooling down on its own. Now, some people say, how do we know this isn't a, some kind of natural phenomenon? That, that's a great question. Scientists have been studying that question for decades. The easiest way I've come to think about this is that the Earth is a huge, huge thing. And if you're going to change its temperature, you have to have an enormously powerful source of energy. And in fact, the only source of energy that powerful is the sun or uh, energy derived from the sun. Now, one of the ways it could happen is that the Earth could just get closer to the sun. That would heat the Earth up. And in fact, the Earth's orbit is not stable. It's an oscillating ellipse. And as the planet gets further from the sun, when the ellipse gets larger, the planet spends more time further away from the sun and ice accumulates on our planet, one of the drivers of the ice ages. But these changes happen on the scale of 40 to 100,000 years. So that can't explain what we're seeing today. Now, another thing that could happen would be that if the sun were just to get hotter, the Earth would get hotter. And in fact, the sun's output does vary, and it varies on the scale of decades. But when we look at the sun's output, which we can measure very accurately now with satellites, we find that the output of the sun has been declining over the last 40 years, and the changes in solar output are not enough to explain the changes in temperature that we see on the planet. If we put these natural changes into a model that looks at ocean temperature, this is something that was done by Tim Barnett at UC San Diego, then here's what the <clears throat> predictions for these natural variations look like. And these big dips you see on the screen are caused by major volcanic eruptions, which put <clears throat> particles up in the atmosphere like a parasol over the Earth. But they only last a couple of years before gravity pulls them out. If we then put into the model the carbon dioxide concentrations that we are measuring in the atmosphere, then the model says, well, because of the greenhouse effect, this is what ocean temperatures should look like. So now we have a hypothesis, and we can test it by measuring the temperature of the ocean. And when we measure the temperature of the ocean, this is what we see. The key point here is that there is no explanation for what we are observing except for the impact of greenhouse gases. And for you fans of logic, there is no explanation for why greenhouse gases are not causing this. Those are two separate things. And this is why the US Supreme Court held in 2007 that the EPA had to regulate greenhouse gases as a threat to public health and safety pursuant to the Clean Air Act, because there's no other explanation for what is happening. And as our climate is disrupted, we're already seeing changes and they're going to get more severe. 
We're gonna see changes in the availability of water, changes in the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries. Already we're seeing changes in the availability of water in California. In particular, <clears throat> we are seeing the snowmelt pulse that comes down our rivers in the spring. That's what we capture to use in the summer and the fall. That snowmelt pulse is becoming a smaller percentage of the total runoff because we're getting more rain in the winter instead of snow. This was predicted and this is what the Department of Water Resources is seeing, this decline in the Sacramento River, our largest river in California. <clears throat> we're gonna see an increase in the prevalence of heat and humidity. And here's a picture of, of what <clears throat> it'll look like in Santa Clara County by the end of the century. But to give you a sense of what we can do, and I'll come back to this in a minute, if we have an aggressive effort to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, then at the end of the century, the picture will look like this. We're seeing changes in the concentration of air pollutants because photochemical smog is a temperature dependent process. We're seeing change in the geography of disease, the whole concept of tropical diseases. This concept reflects the fact that the creatures that pass these diseases among people live in the tropics, but that's no longer true. Aedes aegypti, the Asian tiger mosquito, is well established now in North America. This uh, creature is the, responsible for transferring Zika, dengue, <coughs> chikungunya, and yellow fever between people. <clears throat> and in fact, here's what they're finding in Florida. It used to be you only had dengue in Florida if somebody brought it in because they got infected, say, in the Caribbean. But now what's happening is that the mosquitoes are there. So when someone comes in infected in the Caribbean and they get bit by a mosquito, the mosquito now can transfer dengue to other people in Florida. We're gonna see damages from storms and droughts and wildfires. This has become evidently clear to so many Californians. And we're seeing, gonna see change in the property loss, sea level rise and coastal erosion. This is something that's gonna be a very big deal in the Bay Area. And we're seeing a change in the distribution and abundance of species. In particular, an incredible loss in the abundance of species, everything from, from amphibians to birds. And this reflects damage to the ecosystems that support these creatures. And of course, those are the same ecosystems that support us. Now, when we look at sea level rise, here's the kind of projections that we see. Yet with every passing year, I have to tell you that blue line is moving towards the red line. The white line is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> when we look at, at, at and, and if you note, these are not straight lines, right? They're curves. So sea level rise is going to be accelerating. It'll be going up faster in 2100 than it is today. We can see what this means for us when we look at our king tides today, our highest tides, when the sun and the moon are aligned. And what we can see is that the edges of the Bay Area are going underwater. And we have a lot of transportation infrastructure around the edge of San Francisco Bay. And this is going to be a huge, huge issue for us. In addition, another physical fact that we have to deal with is that warm air can hold more moisture. And so when it rains, we are getting downpours. They're going up all over the country, all over the world. You just have to you know, go, go, go look at the news once a month and you'll find evidences of it. Of course, just you know, last month, it was the, the rains that caused the dams to break in Michigan. And we see these kind of floods here too. And we're gonna see them more because there's gonna be more rainfall and our flood control infrastructure was not designed to deal with these kind of rainstorms. But of all these effects, the one that keeps me up at night is the political cascade of events that can ensue when people do not have enough food, water, or shelter, and they have to migrate. Uh, the ex-director of the CIA, R. James Woolsey, um, and colleagues did a study in 2007, and this is what they concluded. So profoundly disquieting. I think we all have to decide for ourselves what that means. I wasn't sure until I saw this picture. I found this profoundly disquieting. This is with tens of thousands of people on the move. Imagine when it's millions, which is what is predicted for the middle of this century. So if we go back to our questions, must we change? I think the answer is clearly yes. The second question was, can we change? 
Well, all I can say is thank goodness the answer to this question is yes as well. We already possess the fundamental scientific, technical, and industrial know-how to solve the problem. Let me give you a little uh, uh, story here about how this works. So the, the orange here is our, our emissions rising and on the current path. We need to head this direction. And that means there's this whole triangle of emissions that we have to forego. So how do we do this? That's a pretty big task. And the way to do it is to realize that we can slice it up into small pieces. There's no silver bullet for this problem. It's silver buckshot. And let me go through a few samples of the kind of things that we can do. The first thing is using energy more efficiently. We can get the same services we desire, but with less energy and therefore less emissions. California has already shown how easy this is to do. This blue line here is the electricity use per capita in the 49 other states of the union, and the green is California. And this is because in Jerry Brown's first administration, we adopted energy efficient building codes and uh, energy efficient appliance standards. So all of our buildings now have double pane windows. You know, new refrigerators today, they use 85% less energy than refrigerators in 1980. And we also have new technologies that are appearing that are gonna help us reduce energy use even more, like LED lights. They were a novelty 10 years ago and they're gonna take over the lighting market in the next 10 years. They use one-tenth of the electricity that um, incandescent lights do. The next piece is to electrify our transportation system. And this is something that we are starting to do. About 13% of the cars sold last year in California had an electric component to them. We have a long way to go, um, but electric cars are amazing. I would encourage you, if you have not driven one, go test drive an electric car. There are now two of them at my house. We just, we love it. I mean, it's their, they're, they're cheaper to operate. They don't vibrate, they don't smell, they, they're wonderful. And I encourage you to do it. They are getting cheaper because battery prices are dropping significantly. And this is allowing us to think now about electrifying entire sectors of our transportation system. In fact, uh, buses is, are, are a great place where you can do this. The new buses in California are gonna be all electric. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle here <clears throat> is to generate electricity without using fossil fuels. This is also something we know how to do. We're doing more and more of it. We have the technology and the technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper over time. Uh, this is also true for offshore wind power now. Um, the cost of solar cells has just plummeted um, and this has allowed solar power to be adopted at a much faster rate <clears throat> than was projected just uh, a decade ago. And solar power is showing up in places you might not expect it, like the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum, which has put a solar array on the roof to reduce their utility costs. The next piece of the puzzle is what we call natural carbon solutions. The idea here is that carbon is part of an ecological cycle. There's only so much carbon on the planet, and it's constantly moving from the atmosphere into plants, those plants maybe turn into fossil fuels. We dig up the fossil fuels, we burn them, and it goes back into the atmosphere. And so ecosystems can be part of the solution. Here's just a, a rendering of that idea of carbon cycling through um, our ecosystems. And what we can do is we can, what now is being called the Healthy Soils Initiative. We can use agricultural practices and forestry practices to actually pull carbon into the soil. And this is a win-win for farmers. Take a look at these two pieces of land. On the left, you have the plot using regenerative agricultural techniques where they don't till the soil, they plant cover crops, um, and you get a much richer agricultural system. <clears throat> Another piece is a carbon price. We live in a market economy. Market economies will efficiently allocate resources, but only when the price in the market reflects the cost of goods. And right now we have a situation where because we subsidize fossil fuels and we allow costs, that is climate change and health effects, to be external from the market, 
We have these external costs. This is something you run across in the third chapter of any economics textbook. Costs external to the market real, make, make, make us have a price that is not uh, accurate. And so what we need to do is stop subsidizing what we don't want and substitute what we do want. And we are already subsidizing renewables, but nothing like the level at which we are subsidizing fossil fuels. So you can see then that we, with just these five slices, we've addressed that triangle of emissions we have to forego. And there are other slices we can do as well. But what we can't do is delay. If we delay, we want to go this way, but if instead, if we start climbing this curve, we literally have to jump off a cliff to get to where we need to get to. And if we had followed President Carter's ideas, of course, we would have a much gradual, much more gradual uh, uh, path. We are able to grow our economy while we're reducing our emissions. This is what's happening in California now. But of course, this is only a down payment on the kind of carbon emissions that we need, reductions, pardon me, that we need. But Here's what economists are saying. The most expensive thing we can do is to do nothing and just allow these costs, the impacts to accumulate over time because they'll just get larger and larger and larger. So can we change? The answer is yes, we have the capacity to change. But the third question, will we change? This is a question we haven't answered yet. Now, if you told me 10 years ago that every country in the world would get together and sign an agreement recognizing that we have a common problem we have to work on, I would have told you, you're dreaming. But that's what happened in Paris. And we can be the change we want to see in the world, each of us. We talked about our transportation choices, our food choices influence how much carbon we end up producing, right? Foods have different carbon footprints, in particular beef is very carbon intensive to produce, much more so than say pork or chicken. And I'm not telling everyone, you gotta be a vegan. Now, if you have vegan friends, I know you've already heard that before, but I'm not saying everyone's gotta be a vegan. You just need to try and reduce the frequency with which you eat these high carbon foods. We can purchase renewable power. We do not have to buy, most communities now, you can have an option to buy renewable electricity. You don't have to buy the electricity that pg e is providing. We need to be politically active. And this, please, this is a bipartisan exercise. If you are a Republican, whatever the values, whatever the principles are that drew you to the Republican Party, we need to use those values and principles to promote solutions to this problem. And we need to vote for candidates that understand this is a crisis and it doesn't matter about Republican, Democrat, red or blue. People are beginning to wake up here. And sometimes people who you wouldn't expect, like the president of Appalachian Power in West Virginia, this is what he told his Republican governor in 2017. I think Senator John McCain got it right. He noted that this is a this is a moral quandary because of the intergenerational nature of the impacts. <clears throat> and the children today are waking up and they are realizing that physical reality suggests that their future is really endangered. And if you have not had a conversation with the young people in your life, I would suggest you prepare for what you're going to say because they are starting to ask some very tough questions and make some very painful statements like this. Remember that changes that are coming in the next 20 years have already been decided by the emissions we have put into the atmosphere. We've already wrapped ourselves in that blanket. The question is whether we take action today so that 40, 50, 60 years from now, things are different than they otherwise would be. That's the question of our day and we must answer it. Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikert said, we're not passengers on spaceship Earth, we're the crew. We're not residents of the planet, we're citizens. And the difference in both cases is responsibility. Thank you so much for your Zoom attention. And I'd be happy to answer questions however we wanna do this. Well, that was, I've got to, my hats off to you, how you kept that in half an hour. <laughs> that, that's a lot of information. It, 
Let me ask you something, Andrew. Can you, sure. if you had an open platform, how long could you talk about this? <laughs> well, if you ask my wife, you'll get, you'll get the real answer. Uh, <laughs> so I, I have a 40 minute version of it. Um, and it, it is harder to do it in 20 minutes, 25 minutes than it is to do it in 40 minutes because there's so much information. I have left so many things out, um, but it's, it's, a, uh, um, uh, it's just something that, that I find there's many more opportunities to speak like this. And by the way, if any of you know any organization that you think would like to hear this, please go to my website and, and contact me. And um, I, 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 well, I used to travel all over the Bay Area. Now I virtually leap around the Bay Area to give this presentation. Well, we appreciate you. And um, for those of you who don't know, Andrew does, just does this as a public service and that's his attitude. So um, thank you for, for sharing what, what, what you're doing. Um, we can open it up for some questions here. Um, if anyone, I'm kind of looking at the big screen. So if I uh, see Betty has, ha has her hand up, why don't you go ahead and start, Betty? Hi, uh, Andrew, thank you for a fabulous presentation and uh, just extremely powerful in many ways. Uh, the slides and everything, which were so well done, is that for the United States or it was for, is it for the world? And that's the first question. And the second thing is, if we're a little bit further ahead than some other countries, how do we get the rest of the world to come on board as well? So, um, so a couple of things. Uh, certainly the physical reality everybody has to face. Uh, the, the solutions, that, that general solution set applies everywhere. I was giving obviously examples in the United States. Um, so the, I don't think that everybody in the world would agree with your characterization that we're farther ahead than everybody else. Um, and in fact, we are running very quickly in the opposite direction. We're now, in essence, sort of a pariah to the world, as we're the only nation who is not part of, the, or I, we have announced our intent to leave the Paris Agreement. Um, so uh, the, the key thing I think here to recognize is that every government in the world is being told the same thing by their scientists. Everybody is hearing the same thing. Everybody is seeing with their own eyes the same kinds of changes. And in fact, countries that are, have less, fewer resources than the United States are way more vulnerable to what's gonna happen. Um, and and so, so there's a, a need for us to act as the leader to demonstrate this. If you recall that in 2009, the nego global negotiations in Copenhagen broke down, um, but the reason we got the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 was because in 2014, China and the United States signed a bilateral agreement. And the two largest emitters in the world signed a bilateral agreement saying, we recognize this is a problem and we have to reduce our emissions. Um, and so we can't, you know, there's no such thing as half a lifeboat, right? So we can't, we, we need everybody to do this, every nation to do this. But, People will follow our lead just as they have in the past. Um, and, and that to me is the essential thing to recognize that we, we need to do this and that we have, we have collaborators all over the world who are working on these issues in their countries. Um, thank you. We have a, a question from Bert. Um, his question is, how can we take advantage of this pandemic to advance the carbon reduction radically and he's uh, asking about, look at bicycle growth as an example. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, look, this is um, the key thing we need to do here is we need to guide our capital investment. And, and we, uh, it appears to me, although we don't, we haven't this yet, it appears to me that it is likely we will have a major infrastructure bill as part of an effort to get our economy rolling again to provide jobs for people who've lost their jobs. And the question is, what do we build? If we build the same stuff we've always built in the past, we will be assuring that we do not have the capacity to do what we need to do in the future. What is my hope is that we will recognize 
this is a really once in a lifetime opportunity to direct our capital to build for the world that we have, it, that we're going to have in the future. You know, Craig, in my 40 minute version, I mentioned that important environmental philosopher, Wayne Gretzky. So Gretzky was asked, why are you gotcha. such a great hockey player? And he said, it's because I skate to where the puck is gonna be, not to where the puck is. And that's how we have to think about our, um, uh, our, our future because things that we used to accept as unchanging, like the location of the shoreline or the average temperature in a central valley in the summer, these things are changing. And so we have to invest for the future that we know is coming. And that's gonna be the big challenge, but I think that that's something that we suddenly have an opportunity to do. And I, I think that the pandemic, at least for me, um, sitting here in my house like all of you are, you know, the pandemic is, is I heard someone, I, I saw someone said, this is the closest we're ever gonna get to a global meditation retreat. And, and I think we do have an opportunity now to really think about what the challenges are that we face. This is what we're going through now is something that was predicted. It's something that will happen again, just as climate change has been predicted and it's happened. Um, so I hope that we'll really be able to use this now as an opportunity to put ourselves on the path that will allow our children to have a safer and more productive future. Great, great point. And I, I really liked your quote with Gretzky. I think that's, that's like such an appropriate quote for what you're doing. Um, we have a few other questions, Hugh Tuck, and then after that, we'll bring Patricia in for a question. So always slowed me down is that carbon dioxide is such a small percentage of the atmosphere. It's almost like a trace gas. It's only 0.03 percent teeny. Right. So how come it has such an effect? Because carbon dioxide absorbs, remember the picture of the, the infrared radiation leaving the earth, right? Carbon dioxide absorbs that radiation that used to escape the planet. So it acts like a, a, uh, um, a blanket that prevents, now, now prevents that energy from escaping. And so over time, that energy adds up and adds up and adds up and adds up. Um, the amount of energy that is being pumped in mainly to the ocean is where the extra energy is going. And if you go to my website, there's a, a blog post called the unseen atom bombs. And I work out the math for you, but we are, it's as though we're exploding 400,000 Hiroshima scale bombs a day in the ocean. That's how much energy is being captured. Um, some people like to use the example of a poison, you know, arsenic, is poisonous at the parts per billion level, not the parts per million level, right? So things can have a major impact if the system is sensitive to them. And that's exactly what we're ha happening here. The system is sensitive to carbon dioxide. Uh, Patricia, you had a question next. Uh, congratulations on demonstrating an expert who is passionate about delivering their message and can get it across in any environment. Thank you so, very much. Thumbs up to you, and I hope you'll come back for the next part. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that. My question is, if you were talking to us as mere mortals and said, all right, mm -hmm. you're committed, you believe, you agree, here are the top five actions or 10 actions you can do today to model to everyone in your environment how we do our part, what would they be? Well, they'd be the things I put on the list. So our transportation, so as Californians, right, we get a lot of electricity from renewable sources in part because of all the hydro we get out of the Sierras. Um, and we're expanding uh, uh, solar power incredibly quickly, um, but it needs to be faster. We need to be bolder, more ambitious in what we do. And so I would encourage people, the, the main things that I talk about are transportation choices, food choices, 
encouraging renewable electricity by using your purchasing power as a consumer, um, but also voting on this issue, telling your candidates and your elected representatives, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, that, that this is a problem that you feel in your heart is a huge thing for us to deal with. This is a priority. And until our elected officials, who unfortunately, by our system, they tend to think two years ahead or four years ahead, right? And, and we have to tell them that we want them to think further than that. And I would encourage you to expose yourself to some of the young people who are beginning to take action on this because you will get their visceral sense of how vital this is for their future. And, and, and if you have kids, if you, if you have been in this situation of caring for young people, I, I think that you, it, it's just natural to recognize, you know, that once you get over the grief of what I'm, <laughs> what I'm implying here, I, is, is that, that we all have to start pulling as hard as we can on the rope together to make this happen. And that, that involves, that definitely involves a huge transformation. But just because this transformation is outside of our experience, that doesn't mean it's outside of our capabilities. You're muted, Craig. Greg, you're muted if you're talking to us. I was talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm turning the mic off to try and be a good uh, Zoom citizen. Um, Andrew, it's I just thank you so much. It's it's uh, it's 8:47 right now, and I'd like to keep things going till about nine o'clock. Uh, the the meeting typically ends at 8:30. How how are you on time? Can you can you answer uh, a few I, more I, questions? I, I, I... I, I'm, I love to do this. I'm happy to. to oh, okay. Um, well then, you know, you know, why don't we just take, just take a quick minute though. And um, for, for those of us that have to leave, if you need to leave, you know, no problem. Um, and, and I just like to say, thank you, you know, right now. So you have been awesome. And um, so we'll, and we'll have some more questions for you. And uh, also I'd like to take a moment while everyone's on here next week, we have Aurora Vatican that's going to be speaking. So um, and there she is waving. Hi everyone. Yeah, so she's Aurora is going to be sharing with us next week, and um, so let's continue with the Q and A. And um, who has another question? I'm trying oh. to see here. Bill Buchanan always has a question. Bill, unmute Bill. There you uh, go. Good morning. Uh, you're right. I always have a question. <laughs> um, first of all, Andrew, thanks very much for a very comprehensive uh, and informative. Um, presentation. Uh, I have an interest in weather because we have an organic garden. I'm a mountaineer. As you can see, I'm broadcasting from the eastern flank of Lassen Peak at night. And we, we do a lot of uh, ski mountaineering. So we watch the weather like a hawk when we're up there. I've always had an interest in weather. And it's always great to have a, an update on what's happening. Um, about 10 years ago, I guess as president or, you know, program director or something like that, with the help of my beautiful bride, uh, we were able to recruit Carolyn Ravel, um, one of uh, Al Gore's act, thousand of, uh, she, she's one of a thousand acolytes that Al Gore recruited to go around the country and talk about, you know, um, weather and that sort of thing. And then I followed up by inviting a professor from San Jose who gave a little bit different uh, take on it. It was uh, quite interesting. Um, as a matter of fact, if you're interested in what the weather is in Southern Marin County, I can look over here and tell you that it's 72.6 uh, degrees inside the house and 75.2 degrees outside. So I have more information than you pos possibly would like. A couple of questions for you, Andrew. Um, and number one is, is it established scientific fact that there is a direct correlation uh, between the rise of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and extreme weather. That's question number one. And number two um, addresses this problem of uh, implementing changes. Why is there so much resistance to nuclear power? I'm going to mute myself out here. Okay, let's see here. Uh, uh, the first question, um, the, uh, the 
the, the way to think about the extreme weather is that the factors that result in extreme weather, many of them are influenced by the energy in the system. So, uh, um, and there's no doubt, for example, that at that, that predict the, our understanding, say, of major hur of hurricanes or, or what are called typhoons in the Pacific or cyclones in the Indian Ocean, these have been projected to get stronger, not necessarily more frequent, but stronger because the ocean water is getting hotter. And they projected to intensify faster because of that. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, uh, for example, for tornadoes, uh, I'm not an expert on tornadoes, but there are about five or six things that need to happen in the atmosphere. Not all of them are influenced by climate change. So for tornadoes, for example, there is uh, uh, it's not nearly as strong a, a, a correlation with climate change. There's also, you know, the, the uh, uh, extreme events of uh, the, the droughts getting more extreme because as it warms up, things dry out more. Fires getting more extreme because the vegetation is so dry in these situations. Uh, these are all changes that have been predicted and we're seeing occur. So I think, yes, there's a very strong um, understanding that the climate change is a key driver, not the only reason, but a key driver for the fact that we're seeing more extreme events. Um, for nuclear power, that's a great question, right? Nuclear power currently provides about half of our carbon-free electricity. And if we're going to decide we don't want to use nuclear power plants, well, then where's that? We, we, we're, we're digging even a deeper, you know, a, a, a carbon electricity hole that we have to climb out of. Now, that being said, um, the reality is that nuclear power is not expanding. Uh, and despite 40 years of research and development, nuclear power remains one of our most expensive sources of electricity. Uh, and um, because of the nature of nuclear power, it is also extraordinarily dangerous, right? You, you can't build a nuclear power plant without getting loan guarantees from the government. No one will finance it for you. You cannot operate a nuclear power plant without the taxpayers providing your insurance because it's too dangerous and no private company will insure it for you. Um, I have gone over some of these issues in much greater detail in a blog post I wrote called The Nuclear Mirage that you can find on my website. And the, the way I look at it is this, which is that to the extent that we have nuclear power plants that are operating economically and safely, uh, it's my opinion that we should keep them going because it makes things more challenging for us to uh, achieve our carbon goals. But what we're seeing is that nuclear power plants are being turned off by utilities because they're very expensive to operate and because they can't really follow the load very well. So there are a lot of reasons why, why we're seeing nuclear power um, uh, decline. I also am personally very concerned about nuclear proliferation, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. This is not something that can be separated from nuclear power. Um, most of the nuclear uh, powers in the world, like India and Pakistan and Israel, have all obtained their fissile material for bombs from nuclear power plants. Uh, and we can see the challenge of even allowing Iran to build one nuclear power plant. And so if we're going to really have nuclear power be a solution to the problem, we have to be building hundreds and hundreds a year. And that's just not, I, I, I don't see that as an economic um, uh, uh, reality at the moment. I, we might have some, there may be some more advanced nuclear power technologies that can be operated more economically, efficiently, and more safely. Um, this has been something that people have been trying to do for decades, and it has been an ongoing challenge. Indeed, Bill Gates founded a company uh, several years ago called TerraPower, and they uh, uh, said they had a, a, a new design for a nuclear reactor called the Traveling Wave Reactor, um, but that reactor itself has run into problems, and um, Gates is now publicly questioning whether nuclear power can really be an effective part of our climate solution. Um, that was that was awesome. Um, Michael Sarah had also put uh, Andrew's uh, link on the group chat, so thanks for doing that, Michael. And um, I think we have a couple questions here. Uh, Joel Panzer has a question. I think Pete, Pete, did you have a question also? 
Yeah. All right. So Joel, you go first, and then Pete, you can follow. Andrew, thank you so much. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic talk. I really appreciate thank you. it. Two questions. Uh, question number one, where are we with wave power? Number one. And uh, number two is, as they say, put your money where your mouth is. Where do you invest to uh, make a profit and do well for the, the world as well? Okay. Well, so um, let's start with the second one. I'm not an investment advisor. <laughs> so I will leave that to others. Um, I do know that over the last few years, if you have not had fossil fuel stocks in your portfolio, you've done pretty well. Um, I just, I think that personally now, when we make our major purchases, particularly cars, um, we have a chance to push the, the pile in the right direction. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's the uh, first, uh, the second question. Your, your, pardon me, your first question was, I, Repeat it for me again, I can't remember. Wave. Oh, thank you, wave energy, all right. So, so the, um, uh, uh, wave energy or, or tidal energy in general, there's a tremendous amount of energy there. Um, it is challenging to harvest in part because the ocean is a very, very difficult engineering environment. It's very, very corrosive. Um, one place where you're seeing a uh, uh, wave, a uh, tidal energy being uh, um, captured is in Scotland, where there are there's, there's a larger tidal range, right? So the difference between high tide and low tide, you know, in California here is what eight feet or whatever. In Scotland and in Alaska, you know, it's thirty feet, and and so these inlets that fill up with ocean water and then as they recede you get incredible power moving through these straits and under, basically underwater turbines are what are being used to capture that, that energy. Um, there are a lot of designs for wave energy generators and many are being tested uh, and uh, several off, this, off the uh, coast of Oregon, I believe. Um, uh, but it's my understanding that we still have a ways to go <clears throat> push these ocean energy technologies down that cost curve, the way we've seen solar power drop, the way we've seen wind power drop. Thank you. Uh, Pete, you had a question. And yeah, then we'll yeah. go over to we'll go over to Mike Gaylord and then I see Sydney. Th and then I think then I think we're out of time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, first of all, I have to apologize, and I, I, I certainly am remiss. I can't believe that I didn't think of this, but I left my virtual background up, which is a steam locomotive, not the most environmentally friendly uh, transportation power. It shows uh, how we can evolve our technology, Pete. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I actually have a model, believe it or not, of one of the new Caltrain EMUs, and, and I instead stick up the steam locomotive, but I apologize for that. Um, but my, my biggest concern is, you know, Transportation agencies are, are trending towards uh, uh, zero emission uh, fleets. You know, um, we at, at SamTrans, uh, we, we've already got our first electric buses. We're, we're planning on our next round to hopefully add 140 more electric buses. Um, and, and of course, Caltrain, which is operated by us, is, is, is on its way to becoming 100% electric as well. But my biggest concern is that with this, uh, recession that we're in now is will we still be able to get our funding to do everything that we want to do and that does really concern me um, uh, we, we at least at, at sam trans we have a little bit of a jump um uh, caltrain has a jump but i still think the the uh, the recession is going to impact other agencies uh, it may um you know 80 percent of our our rolling stock buses, trains, et cetera, are paid for by the federal government. We come up with the other 20%. But my concern is that, you know, is that money going to keep flowing? Uh, are we going to be able to buy as many buses and trains as we want, or will we have to cut back? And, and of course, the, the equipment that we're using now, even though all of our diesel buses are the cleanest of clean diesel, uh, that still is nowhere near zero emission. And, uh, and of course, our uh, commuter locomotive fleet is most of them go back to like 1985. So they, they are not, uh, you know, tier four, tier four plus, they're like tier zero. So, uh, I mean, we need to replace them. And, and so the concern is, you know, what, 
with this with the recession is that we're, are we still going to be able to fund this? So, um, you know, I, we're also concerned about ridership. You know, are people are people going to be afraid to get back on a crowded bar train or a crowded cow train? So, um, I mean, we've got a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us. And, and I have to say, while we're trying to do our best to, to mitigate the environmental impact of our, our system, um, there's other things working against us. And, and I don't know how we can overcome that. But, uh, you know, you're, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I love it when I have somebody in the audience who's a real expert in one aspect of this. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, certainly the ridership issue is one thing. I, this is what I was kind of referring to when I talked about the federal stimulus and like, what are we going to spend our money on? But underwriting this is a really important point, which is that people who say we can't afford it seem to think that there's a choice here. And, and, and the point that scientists have been trying to make for over a hundred years is that there isn't a choice. Uh, and and um, uh, there was no choice that we had to address the coronavirus. And, and there's arguments about how we should do it, but of course we had to deal with it. Well, the, the climate change problem is just like the coronavirus, except it's gonna play out over decades instead of over months. But it's the same basic issue. We have to deal with this. If we ignore it, all we're doing is running up our kids' credit cards. You know, that's all we're doing. And, and they are going to just, at a certain point here, they're very close to, to just really getting much more um, uh, aggressive in their, their, um, their complaints because it's going to become very, very clear that there, there, there really isn't a choice. Either we deal with the problem or we don't. And if we don't deal with the problem, we suffer. And the less we deal with it, the more we suffer. All right, everybody.